We've heard a little bit about him before, but I want to read you something that I just think is quite remarkable. This uh, gentleman I'm about to introduce is Ari Tro. Tro. Uh, he said, like, Tro, Tro, your boat. So Ari Tro, uh, he is with the XYO Network. And my first question to him is, so you're the guy that's going to help me send a text message from Mars in less than 30 minutes. So he said he's working on it. But um, one of the things that he is like a serial entrepreneur and I think maybe my favorite fact about him is that he was very interested in computers, found the Atari computer system, learned how to do all of the programming, started a business at 13, uh, some kind of printing business, and so I think he's been um, starting up companies ever since then. So please make welcome Ari Tro and listen to all of the innovation in Bitcoin and fabulous thing he has in store to help us get to Mars. Come on out here, Ari. Thank you very much. Um, so for, uh, first of all, thank you very much um, to uh, Humans to Mars for having me here. Um, I'm a little, little bit of a strange guest, I suppose, from the, the fact that um, no conference or summit is complete nowadays until somebody stands up on stage and says the word blockchain, because it's this buzzword that everyone's been hearing about. And so I'm that guy today. I'm one of the, you know, the guys who talk about blockchain and, um, and talk about buzzwords, basically. But the big question, of course, you guys have is, well, how does it apply to, to space or to the moon or to Mars or any of these things? And um, I'll get to that, but the, really the thing I want to talk about first is like, what part of blockchain really fascinates me. And um, most people, when they think about blockchain, they think about crypto, which is going to be like Bitcoin or cryptocurrency and, and those sorts of things. And that's obviously a big part of it. And then there's also um, governance. You know, so people are talking about making nations or citizenship or voting with, with blockchain, and there's a lot of uses for those. So those are actually two things you could have in space as well. And people have talked about that and proposed that. So well, how do you actually, um, in space, do those sorts of things? Like, How do you have a citizen of, of the moon or a citizen of, of Mars? Um, how do you have currency on those? And you can actually use blockchain for those. But the thing which really uh, fascinates me is data. And so um, I'm a self-proclaimed dataist. And so I tend to be very much about generating, sharing, and um, securing data, really, is what it comes down to. And making sure I know where the data came from or what the data's provenance and uh, value is. And also, uh, the value which I place on data is very high. Like, for example, um, yeah, I, I used to, she mentioned, you know, uh, have an Atari computer, and I, I love old video games and that sort of a thing. So to me, the value of an old disc that has has this is almost a little piece of art because somebody out there you know, made this this piece of data that's unique. And if you lose it, it kind of goes away forever. And so the way I look at, at the world, and I kind of started my my current company in 2012, thinking about this is it's the whole world is all it is is a bunch of different data sets that intersect with each other, and they're these. You know, Venn diagrams and it's, it's data set theory, basically. So if you can actually capture all this data and view all this data, you can actually get this complete view of what actually is reality and the world. But it's kind of in uh, a different lens. So if you go and ask different people, each person has like, this view in their mind of what the world is and, and you know, what they view as a world. That's why you have differences of opinions. You know, somebody cuts you off in traffic, it's probably because they freaked out because they wanted to get to the off-ramp, right? In their reality, they were doing the right thing. In my reality, I was doing the right thing. This kind of conflicted. So you have these different, different perspectives. And so um, when we started my company, we're making IoT devices. And the idea of these IoT devices was to be able to collect data with sensors and to be able to, to see the world. But we ran into a pretty major problem. And that problem is, um, how do you actually share this data? And if you have one system, it's pretty easy. So if I was Apple, and I have all these devices, they're all Apple devices, I can share all my data pretty easily with myself because I trust myself. And so you end up with these silos of data, but they call them data swamps nowadays. And um, the data swamps are pretty much, 99% of data goes unused or goes wasted because there's no way for other parties to be able to see the data. So for example, on the first trip to Mars, this is not gonna be a big problem because um, I'm pretty sure everyone in this room is pretty trustworthy. And I even leave my backpack in my chair here because I don't think anyone's gonna be stealing my backpack. And you guys are pretty sure you're not gonna to get to Mars and there's gonna be somebody out there who's gonna be providing data that is nefarious or 
error prone on purpose because there's actually no one there. You're the only, only party. So there's no concern about data security or data vulnerabilities from that standpoint at this point in time. But it will get there, right? Well, someday we'll have a lot of different people on Mars, a lot of different people on, on the moon, but we're already getting there in space. If you look at um, as satellites, and it's like this cone of innovation that we get, and it's getting faster and faster. And um, so that's really where I'm kind of fascinated with this whole, whole data thing. So um, how many people here have, um, are familiar with blockchain or have heard blockchain before or understand how it works? Okay, well, uh, I'll explain it a little bit um, uh, for some people who don't know about it. All blockchain really is, is you take data and you use cryptography to be able to um, sign it and put it into a chain. So you know the sequence of data that happens. So for example, if I'm recording someone's heart rate or uh, any sort of sensor data, I can see this, this series of events that went in there. And then later on, if one of them's removed or one of them's changed, it's very evident because the hash will break. The hash will no longer be true of the data that I had collected before. And if I were to remove one of the blocks, then the hashes that are inside these blocks won't match anymore. So I'll know data has been either removed or has been changed. So it's, it's a very self-evident thing. And the, the biggest use for this is for systems that are decentralized. So if you have parties that don't trust each other, so trustless data sharing is really where XYO, my company, is focused. And so uh, the O in XYO, by the way, is, stands for Oracle. And so the idea of an Oracle is it can view the world. It gives you uh, an answer about reality. So um, what we do is we make uh, sensors, and we collect data from sensors. You can even get sensors on your phones. We have an app on our phone collect those sensors and you can share them, but all these, these sharing things that go on peer to peer, we sign these and each of our devices has its own little blockchain. It's not a decentralized ledger, it's just its own little memory. So you can think of it as the memory a person would have in their brain, because each person has this, these sets of memories. And then when we talk to people, we actually can communicate those and we have shared memories. So the best analogy I've used for this is if I were to go around and every single person I run into, I'm forced to take a selfie with them and have them sign it and I sign it and we each take a copy of the selfie. And each person goes and puts this in a photo album in order and you have to do this. You know, and if the photo albums change, everyone knows. So if you have all these and you combine them all into one big picture, you actually have a very accurate representation of reality of the world because for any, any one party to go out there and actually change the data point, um, becomes evident that they've changed it. And so it's been altered or it's been changed from the, the past. So without a central authority, you can actually have a very, very stable and a very, very accurate data set. So the use for this um, is almost always in a case where there's multiple parties and things grow. And as we're seeing, like SpaceX, for example, and NASA, they're working on cost reduction for a lot of these different things. And um, the IoT world on Earth is already there where we have billions of devices from different manufacturers that can't really talk, but how do you actually share data between them without having to worry about where they came from? So that's what you use something like this for because you have these untrusted data sources, but I wanna trust that a sensor reading came from one device and I can actually use that data. An example of that, um, I think I have it here somewhere, is that um, a car, for example, if you have an autonomous vehicle or a swarm of, of vehicles, a car can drive itself a lot better if it can actually get data from the other cars around it. But how do I know that someone's not feeding me bad data? So I'm sure you guys also that, that Tesla accident where they brushed the side of the freeway on the little bumper there. The reason for it is because it was using its own sensors and its own video to be able to see where the freeway's edge was and it didn't notice it until it was too late. But if it could get data, metadata or actual data from the car in front of it or the other cars around it, or if I had reason cameras that are on the traffic signs, and trust that data, it could have seen that all the rest of the cars are kind of swerving a little bit before they get there, and it would have known way ahead of time that that actually happened. But normally you can't do that because of privacy concerns or just because, you know, why would Tesla trust BMW data or vice versa? So in a situation like this, if you have this data and you can always know where it came from and it gets handed around, um, I can actually take a piece of data from that car and say, hey, I know this came from a Tesla or from a BMW, it was signed, and then now I pass it to the next car. So I can take the data from three or four cars ahead of me and keep on passing it down. And nobody has to go and actually ask a server, is this data valid? Because they can use math. They can use cryptography to say, is this signature valid? Does it actually link up with the rest of the blockchain? So you can share that data there. But the need for this is because you have a whole bunch of autonomous vehicles and autonomous devices trying to work together but needing to share data that's, that's separate. And you see this problem right now in, in, in smart homes. I don't know if any of you guys have smart homes at home or connected homes, I actually call them. Um, 
do they actually talk to each other? Do, you know, does your Alexa and your Apple and your Google Home all communicate very well? Probably not, right? So if they could, they could actually do a lot, a lot more together there. So uh, one of the things we do also is, is the AI portion of it. And so at the edge devices, we take data, like video, and we, we boil it down to metadata. And this is the topography of our, of our network out there. So the Sentinels are what's on these edge devices, and they go and they collect the different data. Um, they boil it down to metadata if they have to. And then the bridges send it to our archivists, and the archivists store it, and the diviners an um, answer the questions. So that's a, a pretty straightforward, basic architecture view of the network, but it's all decentralized. So nobody has to actually go and trust each other. So it helps with GPS, for example. So one of the problems with GPS is I can go and set up broadcasters, and I can broadcast fake GPS signals and then jam people or, the, or they can, you know, I can affect where they, they go to. But there's no way to know if that GPS signal is valid or not. So uh, in our system, we tie a piece of data to a very specific place and time in the universe. Um, it's, that's what we call our company XY, but it's really an XYZT exercise, and it's all relative data. The reason why um, we use relative data is that you can only mathematically prove the existence of relative data. I can prove that I'm in this room right now with you guys, but I can't prove that I'm in Washington, D.C. However, like in a normal mathematical proof, if I were to say, uh, I'm, in, I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm going to assert that I'm in Washington, D.C. It's an axiom to me. Then I can say, in my reality, since you guys are all within a certain proximity of me, you must be in Washington, D.C. as well. So you can actually mathematically get certain answers from relative uh, data points, but you can't get any absolute um, answers. So many of the use cases, as we have on here, there's um, logistics, there's e-commerce, uh, smart cities, aut autonomous vehicles and devices. Uh, they all can benefit from this, this cross-sharing um, of, the, of the data that's out there. And then um, you basically have a, a public view of all this data, and that's kind of the dataism side of me, where I personally believe that transparency and more data is actually a better way to communicate with each other as opposed to privacy and secretiveness, because that way we know what, what's going on around us. And um, there's kind of a cultural shift, and I think right now we see it kind of going the opposite direction. So um, in space, for example, uh, one of the things that's happening, we have more and more and more satellites that's out there, and they're from different countries and different um, organizations out there. So being able to actually use relative data in space to be able to have them know where, where they are relative to each other and the ability for them to communicate is something which can definitely be done with a protocol like this in a decentralized way. And the thing which is nice about it being decentralized is there's no, well, this is my system, I want everyone else to use it. No one's actually controlling a system. It's just a, a protocol that people agree on and it is completely um, unmanaged, for lack of a better term. So there's very little contention on who, who controls it. So that's why I think Russia right now has they have their own GPS system, the US has their own GPS system, and China has their own GPS system because they all want to control their own GPS system because they don't trust each other. So if you can have a system where trust is not required, it's completely trustless, it makes it way easier to collaborate. So um, yeah, on Earth right now, we're, we're building this thing out with all the different IoT devices out, that's out there to have the system work and have uh, topography. We have uh, about a million devices that we've generated to date. We have a whole bunch of people using our apps. So we have a live system that's collecting all this data. Uh, people share it, they share it voluntarily because they're either dataists or they also get some tokens from our, our system to be able to do it. And um, this, is the, this model is something which will scale perfectly to any of the rest of the levels as that need arrives. So um, as satellites need this communication because there's more and more of them and as uh, the moon would need them, for example, we would want to have those there as well. Um, my personal belief is that the, the, the pace of use is always uh, nonlinear compared to the cost. So I think um, the rule of thumb is uh, every time you half the cost of something, you go up an order of magnitude of demand for that device. So every time you half the cost of uh, satellite launches, for example, you're going to have 10x use of satellites. So for us to get to hundreds of thousands or millions of satellites in these low micro satellites is going to be something which happens really soon. And once the cost of the moon goes lower and lower and lower, you're going to have hotels there and you're going to have all these different things. So having collaborative protocols for, for data that goes on there, I think, is something which is very important for um, any of these really fast-growing, fast-moving uh, environments that specifically don't have a uh, very good uh, definition over who governs those rules. Because 
I think it's one of the problems in space in general is there's no governing body that, that you know, can force anybody to actually follow the rules. So having an agreed upon protocol, I think, is a, is a good value there. Um, so uh, the, the, the proof of concept is basically our, our ground-based system. And then we also are looking at using um, satellites to link the different systems together. So being able to use satellites to be a calibration point for our system on Earth is something which is very valuable. But then once you have that, you can also link the data from Earth to the links to the data on the satellites and that sort of thing. So you can actually have links between the different strata of the different systems that are out there. So that's uh, pretty much the, the overview of, of how we view uh, data collaboration and trustless data sharing in the current you know, terrestrial Earth view of IoT devices and how that goes to uh, the level of satellites and then further out as that need grows. But the, the short term, you know, once you only have one party going out there, it's not necessarily required soon for Mars. Um, obviously, I would love you know, for us to have 100 different participants all having some sort of presence on Mars in 10 years, but I'm not sure that's going to happen that soon. Well, thank you very much. You all have questions? Anybody want to ask a question? As a Silicon Valley person, hi. Um, I want to say I really like your company. Uh, as a policy person in my past, I can say, ask you, I want to ask you this question. How do you envision all those uh, governments with competitive policies that everybody wants to lock things out? Like, remember what happened with internet. Designed originally as a global good that is free of borders. It, what we see now is like this balkanization that every government wants to link its data separately, China, Russia, United States. I understand that space is everybody's mission, but don't you think this is what exactly can happen in the future, that like, we will, because it is competitive, it's because it is a space race, that uh, it will, there will be policy difficulties and, and jurisdictional and uh, country dif difficulties to share this data. So how do you suggest to overcome this policy uh, kind of confrontation? Well, I, I think it has some of the same difficulties um, that the internet has, but the internet has the, the concern where it's still an authoritative-based system. You have to actually go to a name server to actually get data of where to go to for the IP resolution. And for example, one of the easy ways for governments to, to, to block the internet is to just not resolve certain names, or not allow certain names to be resolved, or their, um, their name registration services could you know, ban people from registering names and so on and so forth. You can use firewalls from people to, to actually get there. The thing which is nice about a system like this is that it's all peer-to-peer. -peer. So for example, people can opt out. Um, you know, I'm sure there's countries in the world, I think China's talked about this, of saying, well, let's ban this cryptocurrency or blockchain or whatever it is. And so they can outlaw it. But to actually make it technically really challenging for a person not to be able to communicate with the network is, is really difficult because the network is not centralized at all. So there's no name resolution. There's no way to, to block that. You know, obviously, you can cut off all the different wires from it. So if you can isolate it, you can do that. But I would think um, most concerns out there would want to not opt out of the system from the standpoint that it's all you're doing is isolating yourself. It's a very isolationist approach. And um, it's really difficult. Like, for example, if we were to pass a law right now that Bitcoin's legal in the US, to actually enforce that law would be very, very problematic, where I think outlawing certain websites is a lot easier from a technical and practical standpoint. So I think um, blockchain and cryptography, because it's, it's a self-evident and self-supporting system without the need of servers and authority to actually make it work, uh, is a lot more robust solution for um, uh, regulation resistance, should I say. And you, my dear? In relation to the Internet of Things, you've mentioned a lot of capabilities that blockchain has to bring to the scene. And I was just curious, since some of those capabilities are talking about being enabled by 5G, <clears throat> what the introduction of 5G, how it enable, further enables what you can do, or whether it attracts or detracts from what you're doing? Well, um, I think that's a great question. You know, 5G is coming very fast, and it definitely um, does not detract from what we're doing. I think 5G is going to be making everything even better, and it's going to be faster. Um, the, the biggest value that or I guess the, the biggest cost and benefit of, of 5G is you have more data. 
And one of the biggest problems in, in general is our, our data, data volume that we have that's growing. And we have this, this out of control system. People have these 40 megabit pixels on their phones. And they're taking you know, 20 pictures a day. And so our, um, our data storage needs as a society and that, that growth is something which is getting a little more and more out of control. And 5G is actually gonna make it worse. You know, people are gonna be having 4K videos that they're storing and they're doing. So one of the, the ways that we work around that in our system is we um, make metadata out of it. So we have these dividers and what it'll do is it'll take the data at your edge device and it'll look at that and it can distill it either by compressing it and making a lower version of, uh, of the, the video or you can actually look at that and say, um, well, there's a person in there or there's, you can, you can you know, get the location from it and you can actually store the metadata without actually storing all the video if you want to. Um, so there's, there's different ways to distill that data down to more compressed uh, versions. But there's also um, like IPFS, for example, which is a great solution for blockchain. And the idea of IPFS, and I love the name, by the way, it's, um, it's interplanetary file system, so it's very apropos for, for uh, discussions like Mars and, and that sort of thing. But the idea of, of IPFS is um, any data set, like if I have a video and I share a video with somebody else, it would hash to the same number that's out there. So it's a lot easier for us to take um, one piece of content that might be shared a million times, and instead of having a million copies of it, we can have one or two or three copies of it somewhere in a cache, and everybody can just refer to this, this hash of it. So you actually reduce the amount of, data, of digital waste, for lack of a better term, um, in many, many ways. So I think that's one of the ways that cryptography and blockchain actually is very eco-friendly from the standpoint that it reduces that digital waste. Bitcoin itself is very uneco friendly because you have to do proof of work to, you know, to, to do that. But I think you know, like 5G and creating more data, having more sensors, having phones that can see more things is, is really where a lot of the expansion is going to go. You know, the ability to see through walls, for example, is going to be something which you know, we're going to have to deal with some of these privacy concerns eventually. But sensors that are almost like Star Trek level sensors where we'll be able to have a view of the entire world almost in real time because of this mesh of all these different sensors we have. That's what 5G is going to make available to us. And we, uh, it's going to cause some interesting social questions, you know, like, like how much data transparency is, is enough and what do we do in the case where we have a, a data transparency and how do we uh, potentially socially evolve as humans to, um, to deal with the lack of privacy and um, the fact that that's going to be changing for us. What are some of the key technologies that you still need to see come online to make this really viable in a space context? Um, well, I think that one of the biggest challenges for any of these technologies is latency. So um, like Mars is you know, 30 minutes away for communication. So the way our system works is you, the, the selfie analogy is I have to actually go and you know, I, I get a copy of the payload, I sign it, I give you the copy of the payload with my hash in it, you sign it, and we kind of go back and forth four or five times. So in theory, a bound witness transaction in our system with somebody on Mars from here would take two hours or three hours perhaps, which is very impractical. But the thing which is kind of nice about it is you can do a whole bunch of bound witness transactions on Mars and then just once in a while, once in a day, you know, say for example, you go and link it to Earth or you link it to the moon. And that way you still have a system which is contiguous because you have that bridge between the two different data sets. So it still becomes one contiguous data set. But being able to um, have systems, especially in long range systems in space, which reduce latency, um, and I'm, you know, from a physics standpoint, I'm not a physicist, but from a physics standpoint, my understanding is there's you know, only so much we can do as far as actually getting that faster. So um, getting the, the, the data transport layers as, as good as possible and as fast as possible and energy efficient as possible also, because one of the things I've heard from a lot of these panels since I've been here, is always, you know, battery, how do you get electricity? You know, can you use solar panels? Can you use nuclear reactors? So power consumption for satellites and for space uh, devices in general is always going to be a problem, just like it is for us. Like, you know, we make this little device. I can't, I, I have a pocket here somewhere. But we make a little device that's, you know, more powerful than my you know, Apple to computer or my, my Atari computer from when I was a kid, and it costs only a few dollars to make. It has a battery in there, and this battery will last five years. Um, well, depending on how much you use it, it can use, you know, last between six months and five years. But it's a little itty device like this and costs a few dollars. So the efficiency has gone really, really, really high. And so, um, but this is only Bluetooth, so it only broadcasts a few hundred meters at most. Now, if we want to make something like, like this that we can throw out into space, that's going to last five years, but I'd be able to actually communicate far enough with each other. Those, those battery efficient or those power efficient transport layers, I think, is one of the, the biggest challenges. Thank you. Please, let's give Ari Tro another big round of applause. <laughs>